Thank you for joining us today. My name is Div Bansali. I'm a vice president at Accountants World. Before we go ahead and turn it over to Randy, uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. For the GoToWebinar control panel, if you don't see the panel at any point, uh, you can simply look for the orange arrow and that will expand or hide the panel. You can click on the audio tab to choose telephone or computer speakers. If you choose telephone, it'll give you a dial-in number and an access code there. If you haven't downloaded Randy's slide deck handouts yet, you can go to the handouts tab and you can see his PDF document in there. And finally, if you have any questions at any point during the presentation, go ahead and write those in and remember to click send. That'll come through to myself and Randy and Tom and Sharon here at Accountants World as well. And uh, and we'll be monitoring questions throughout. Randy will be answering questions throughout the presentation and at the end as well. There is one free CP offered for attendance at today's webinar. And the three things you need to do to get CP, uh, number one, attend the live webinar for no less than 50 minutes. Number two, respond to all of the polling questions. There will actually be four today instead of three. And then finally, submit the post-webinar survey within 24 hours after the webinar. So the post-webinar survey will come up as soon as you click out of the browser window uh, for the webinar. When you close that out, you'll see the post-webinar survey pop up. If you don't see it, don't worry about it. We're going to send a thank you email after the webinar, and that'll include another link to that survey as well. You'll receive a notification of your CP by email within three business days, so that should be early part of next week. Also, to make sure that that webinar, uh, that the notification email comes through for the CP, just remember to add webinar at accountantsworld.com to your trusted email list in your email provider. A brief word about our sponsor, Accountants World. Accountants World provides leading solutions for professional accountants for accounting and for payroll. I've talked about the payroll solution in the past, payroll relief, our award-winning payroll solution. A brief word about accounting power. What makes accounting power different is that it's built on a accountant-centric model, and that's a model that puts you, the professional accountant, back in the center of client accounting. So instead of you being in a reactive position and your clients going ahead and using a piece of software that was sold to them and making mistakes and then you cleaning up those mistakes reactively, um, the Accountants World model puts you in the middle. It allows you to customize your accounting engagements and the accounting system for every single client individually so that you and them both experience a win-win there. Those who want to offload their accounting work to you uh, can do so by uh, you offering client accounting services. Those who want to do some of the work in their offices can do that as well. And those who still want to write manual checks or do some other functions uh, can do that as well. And that's completely determined by you. Accounting Power just received a 4.75 star review from CPA Practice Advisor. If you'd like to learn more, please visit accountingpower.com to watch our short video and to sign up for a free personalized demo. So before I turn the floor over to Randy Johnston, um, Randy is the Executive Vice President of K2 Enterprises. They do content delivery uh, on technology and solutions all across the country uh, all across the country and I know Randy will talk about that in a little bit more detail Randy has for seven consecutive years uh, been voted a top 25 thought leader in accounting he's been one of the leading voices in technology for accounting firms for over three decades and was inducted into the accounting Hall of Fame in 2011 so at this time I'd like to go ahead and turn the floor over to Randy Johnston well, thank you, Div, and welcome to all. I had to glance through the attendees, and I know many of you, so I'm very pleased to have you along today. And uh, for those of you that I don't know, hopefully we'll get to meet face-to-face uh, -to -face in the not-too-distant future. Um, you should be seeing my screen at this point in just a couple of uh, follow-on pieces. I do have my NMGI company where we support CPA firms 24 by 7 from Boston and Honolulu. So I've got a team of about 35 there that help provide some of the content for today. And as you heard from Div, our K2 organization is producing about 1,600 events here in the U.S. and about 100 in Canada every year. We are pretty fussy about CPE being factual and we have websites and a YouTube channel that uh, 
you can look at for other information. Again, the handout in our mind is pretty critical today. Uh, we're going to actually refer to things in the handout materials uh, throughout the time, and hopefully you'll find that they're structured in such a way you can come back and see them as well, and they'll have some long-term um, usefulness to you. So that said, um, I pulled a bunch of different topics up into some of the major topics we'll talk about today. There's significant changes in hardware technologies, and this doesn't matter whether you're premise-based or cloud-based. These standards are going to be pretty critical. Uh, we'll see that this applies in processor chips and in video and other connection standards. We're also going to have a real radical change with Microsoft licensing, uh, including the new Office 2019. For those of you that might be Office 365 subscribers, Microsoft has announced that they're going to eliminate the ribbon menu with Office 2019. And if you're an Office 365 subscriber, you're going to have to deploy that within uh, a relatively short period of time, 90 days of release. So a lot of the applications are going to be problematic. We'll try to explain that. We also are cognizant, even though today's session is not on security, of the new breach reporting laws. All 50 states now have them. And of course, GDPR went into effect on May 25. And that's a long arm statute that also needs some compliance attention. And then there's some other innovative applications out there, and I'm going to illustrate a few of those. But we want you to use multi-factor authentication like the YubiKey or Duo. And again, we're not talking about emerging technologies today. A lot of you have uh, gotten used to my tech update presentation. There was so much going on in emerging technology. I've got another whole session that's longer than tech update to talk about those things. So we want you to be aware of artificial intelligence and machine learning, blockchain, and big data, all those are pretty important topics. I've been watching the presenters. Frankly, there's a lot of misinformation going around about those, so be real cautious on those items as you go forward. So the sections of the material today, we're going to hit hardware first, then we're going to spend some time on operating system cloud, a little bit of application security, a little bit of leading edge, and close with some strange but true. Now, what you're going to find when you read materials that I've published, I'm still writing for CPA Practice Advisor for an example and publish articles pretty regularly. I'm trying to do everything with grids. So you'll see me try to simplify this market by publishing grids. So I'm going to have recommendations on how you do on-premise or hybrid or cloud. And, you know, for example, just looking at this, uh, as David just laid out, one of the CAS products I like best is Accountants World's Power CAS, and you can see that's a cloud operation here. But you can see I've also got emerging technologies and some other pieces in here. Here's some hardware and and switches. Again, these all will be covered in the context of the presentation today, but you'll see whenever you see my writing this year, you'll see these grids because I'm going to use them this year and into next, I figure. But let's get started with a little bit of hardware. I'm going to give you some recommendations and we'll talk about different components in the hardware world that are changing. And the first one I'm going to call out is just quantum computing. We figure this about 10 years out, but it is working today. And some of you use weather.com, which is powered by a quantum computer. So you're actually already using quantum computing without knowing it. Quantum computing today can break any of the blockchain that are out there, and it can break any of the cryptography that's out there. So those are both pretty important changes that will happen with quantum. And as we look at the vendors who are playing there, there's lots of big players. Is this ready today? No. Will it be ready in 10 years? We figure yes, although you can go buy one this afternoon from D-Wave if you'd like to do such a thing. So watch what happens with quantum computing. Um, you know, over the last little while, in fact, specifically on June 8th, Oak Ridge National Lab became number one in supercomputing, but China has been number one in supercomputing most of the last year. And we want you to understand that the Chinese dominance in computing has been pretty notable. Uh, and China currently has uh, the largest fabrication plant bypassing Intel at this point. Most of you on the webinar today own products from TSMC. That is, if you have a an iPhone or an Android phone, Samsung or, or Google Pixel, you own TSMC technology. This manufacturing company has seven nanometer fabrication, and Intel can't make that work, as you'll learn more here in a minute. So this, this is very much a competitive technology threat. But a little more simplistically, we want you to buy computers that have a three to five year replacement cycle. 
I'm stretching some laptops to four, some desktops to six at this point. But when you buy new technology, you've got to buy the current stuff, not two-year-old technology at the time. For the first time ever for accountants, we're suggesting that I-5s may be okay. Uh, but generally, we're still recommending I-7s for accountants. That is, if you run Excel. If you don't run Excel, you can get by on I-3s and I-5s, but generally you should have I-7s. Monitors need to be uh, cycled on about a 10-year rotation, and we think solid-state drives are almost mandatory at this point. So the vendors who are competing for processor dominance in the U.S. market are dominantly Intel and AMD. Uh, AMD just actually released a new 32-core processor, but we don't see in the accounting profession right now a need to buy these high-end processing chips. What you should be buying are the Cabby Lake X and the Coffee Lake chips. Out of the 40-some-odd chips available, when you look at the specifications, I've picked four that I believe to be the most appropriate. The first two are the best of these. And this uses kind of the best of the best things that fit accountants' needs in general. Now, Intel has been uh, proposing or uh, trying to get to market a new generation chip based on 10 nanometer technology. They were supposed to get this out in 2016. Indications are right now they may not even get it out this year. It might even be spring next year. So that'll make Ice Lake arrive in 2020 and Tiger Lake buying that. Intel, unfortunately, is not doing well in keeping up with the technologies, although that's still our preferred vendor. So, Div, I think that gets us to the first uh, review question, but to set this up a little bit more, notice that at this point, we want you on Cabby Lakes and Coffee Lakes, but there's a little twist, and that's what this question is about. Okay, so the first poll question should be up in front of our uh, audience at this point. Which of the following is true regarding Intel 7th and 8th generation processors? And so you select one out of those four options. Make sure to click the submit button to make sure that your vote is counted. And a reminder that this is the first of four poll questions today that are required in order to earn CP credit. And Randy, while we are waiting for the poll questions, um, we had a question come in uh, from Patty. What computer configuration would you recommend if you run your entire desktop in a cloud environment and are just using the laptop computer to access your virtual desktop? A beautiful question, Patty, and I am very adamant at this point that the same configuration that you're using for desktop or laptop for premise-based or cloud remains the same. Now, there's been a period of time where people thought you could get by with less computing power uh, by being in the cloud, and you're going to see here in just a minute why I don't think that's true. And frankly, for the minor cost of hardware, the recommendations that I have coming at you momentarily are going to be the right ones, whether you're premise-based or cloud-based. All right, so we are at about... Over 90% of folks have voted, so I'm going to give just a few more seconds here. If anybody has not gotten their vote in, please select one of those options and click Submit. Going once, going twice, and we'll close that out. And uh, So, Randy, we see 56% say Windows 10 is the only OS Microsoft supports. 31% says Microsoft supports all Windows versions for anybody. Yeah, so the key piece of learning here is... With these new generation chips, you can only run Windows 10. And over the next 50 minutes or so, you're going to discover that Microsoft is going to continue to lock in public practice professionals more and more into their environment to the point that you won't be able to get out. I'm calling it the Intel Microsoft Hotel California. You can check in but never leave. And don't feel too good if you're an Apple user because we see the same thing coming down on the Apple side and so forth. So... Net-net on the 7th and 8th gen processors, you got to have Windows 10. Now, that said, that changes the way we look at things a little bit, I believe. Um, people are still writing about how the primary computer vendor volumes aren't all that good or falling off. Here are your six primary vendors, but notice we want you to buy business grade, so that means Asus and Apes. Acer should not be on your purchase cycle. HP, Lenovo, Dell, Apple, those all play. So as you look at these big vendors and look at the shipment volumes, you can still see we're getting 
loosely 70 million computers a quarter. So that isn't a tiny bit of equipment that's coming out there. Further, the equipment can be used a little longer because it's frankly got a longer life cycle right now. But for your next PC, so Patty Moore on answering your question directly, I really want you on an 8th gen i7, if at all possible. And I want you to run 16 gig of RAM in that with a high touch resolution display. A new and first time recommendation for me is that all computers have discrete graphics built into them. We think pin enablement is important and the battery life is getting longer. Some of the products announced in the last three weeks have 24 hour battery life. 100% of the time, whether you're premise based or cloud based, we want solid state drives and we want this technology known as M.2 NVMe SSDs in there. USB-C's we think are mandatory. If Apple does what I think they're going to do with their uh, hardware announcements, we're going to remove Thunderbolt 3, but we're leaving that there for Apple right now. And we think it's important to have a built-in SIM slot, particularly with the 5G cellular coming. So that's a, that's a pretty strong sounding list, but that computer uh, cost is not particularly um, on my like to have, much more expensive than my must have configuration. Now, that said, I'm going to have about eight or ten slides here where I'm going to flip them pretty quickly. And all I was trying to do was just give you some ideas of what's happening with computers out there because uh, all of the vendors make too many computers. We need fewer options. And each of HP, Dell, Lenovo have comparable products here. I want you to see the slice, which is about the size of an old video VHS cassette cartridge. But this product has a wireless charging point on top so you can charge your cell phone on top of the computer, kind of an odd little feature. It is more normal that you see these very small computers, and look at those dimensions, 7 inches by 7 inches by 1.35, very tiny that can be mounted on the back of a monitor. In the Dell line, that's a microcomputer. And again, by the time you get discounts in this, it's not unusual to see them drop in about the $700 range. You can consider all-in-ones, but just recognize if you get an all-in-one computer, your monitor is going to roll away at the same time your computer does. So for many of you, laptops are your call, and you're going to see that I've picked what I think are the primary laptops to consider from the big vendors. In the HP line, it's probably the 850G4. Personally, I run on this machine, the EliteBook uh, G2 360 because I wanted a tablet style high performance ultra light machine. This is lighter than a Mac Air, for example. Uh, or you can go to high end workstation boxes like the Z books. And most of you probably shouldn't be doing a mobile workstation unless you're going to keep it for a long time doing real high performance stuff. So in the Apple line, that means we wind up with things like the MacBook Pro. You'll notice this vendor puts in a discrete processor, the Radeon Pro 560. We'll talk more about why that's important in a minute. In the Dell line, that means the 5590 is probably the right uh, approach. And you can see here they have that built-in cellular SIM slot when they say WAN capable. That's what they're really trying to get across there. In the Lenovo line, the carbons, uh, X1 carbons are just great boxes, and I wanted to have that as the choice there. And maybe the Surface works. Uh, Microsoft's due to get a new Surface Pro out, so this is kind of Surface Pro 4.5, but that's the current version of this. But we caution you that the uh, uh, firmware in these boxes is more unstable right now. Now I did the configurations to try to get apples and apples and prices pretty similar. You can take a look at those, but if you were 100% cloud, you could use Chromebooks for everything. Many of you are not in a position to do that, but the Chromebooks are routinely coming in at about $350 for a touchscreen color unit. A marvelous value, but you can go super high end here too with a Google Pixel Book. So again, there's hundreds of options. I just tried to pick a few as examples. All of these machines should have solid state drives in them. And the reason we're doing that is solid states run an NVMe on PCIe M.2 are radically quicker for boot and regular operating, uh, including when you're all in the cloud. So during the summer here, as time goes on, you're going to see more new high-performance solid-state drives from Western Digital and Samsung. In the last two weeks, Toshiba had a NVMe drive of one terabyte on sale for $122. So we're not talking a lot of money to get this particular job done. We are noting 
that even when people have cloud storage available, they're taking the time to back up in reverse. In other words, out of the cloud to a local storage. This is particularly common with family pictures from phones. You can do that with the quilt shoebox pictured at the bottom and a USB drive, or even for large volumes of data, just to have a spare set of the data available. And most of these units are sub uh, $500 class things. But for very small businesses, we're finding that these can substitute because of their new performance for storage area network technology. On the back end in the cloud data centers, it's dominated by HP and Dell with their rack mount units. And the basic servers here are only a couple of thousand dollars. Most of the money is tied up in memory. That puts the price up into about that $8,000 range that you see. And then driven on the back end is the big storage area networks. So when your cloud vendor's providing you uh, access, they're taking care of all of that storage and server thing on the back end. But this next recommendation is new. Uh, I've followed this for years. I've recommended in the right situations for some time. But for the first time ever, we're recommending every new purchase has discrete graphics. Now you can buy discrete graphics as external units. They're called CUDAs and out of the ones listed at the bottom you can see in bold there the Razor Core is the one that we think is the most attractive. But uh, some very crude graphics might help you see this and I'll try to let the refresh rate run slow enough that you can see what's going on. What I've done here is given a bar that represents a dedicated graphics processor called the NVIDIA GE Force 940. And the graphic underneath that I'm rolling in for you here basically uh, shows you the uh, speed, if you will, of integrated graphics processors. And you can see most of them are quite a bit slower. There's a couple that are faster. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to move that line over to the other side and I'm going to shrink it. Hopefully you can see there's a little tiny bar. That's the same length, but it's shrunk down for scale to lay it into the dedicated side and you can see here pretty much every dedicated processor is quicker than this GE Force 940 that's down at the bottom of that graphic. In the MacBooks, uh, generally what you're going to see is the Radeon Pro 460 which is the one up about halfway, this one right in this area here. And why do we want you to buy these bloody dedicated processors which are going to cost you about an extra $35 per computer? And the answer is very simple. If you run Excel, Excel is going to be modified to take advantage of this. By the way, so is the G Suite family. Number two, if you have machine learning or artificial intelligence, which we think you will during this current ownership period, three to six years, the applications can look for a dedicated processor and say, oh, you got a dedicated processor. We'll put some of this compute workload over in the dedicated processor. If you don't have it, it won't run as fast. And so we're thinking right now it's worth the dedicated graphics processor for video performance with your premise or in the cloud, and it's worth it for Excel, and it's worth it for the new artificial intelligence. So that's a kind of a technical explanation of one little tiny piece of technology that we think is pretty important. Now, it's been 20 years since we've been recommending uh, multiple monitors. Some people have gone a little too far, almost building a cockpit. But there's some new video standards that will arrive here into the fall, including HDR and HDMI 2.1, which we think you need both of those. But we also want you to keep thinking about, do I do all-in-ones? Do I need touch? Should I be using two or should I use one monitor? What should I do? So the first standard you'll want to watch for is HDR, particularly HDR 10 plus. Most of your firms will probably standardize on HDR 600, but brightness is measured in nits, and if you want the best of the best, you're going to go for 1,000 nit monitors. And today, there's no easy way for you to know that the monitor you're getting has consistent brightness. That's what this standard will take care of. Number two video standard, and we recommend now all HDMI cables moving forward, are 2.1 cables. There's a difference between an HDMI 2.0 cable and a 2.1. The key thing is 2.1 is quicker. You can see it's 48 gig versus 18 gig for 2.0. But HDMI 2.1 can also carry other video standards including Thunderbolt 3 and it can handle the USB-C 3.1.3.2 standards as well. Further into the fall 8K televisions will start to rear their 
heads and you're gonna see improved resolutions which you've experienced already uh, quite probably as you went from to HD TV possibly to 4k TV and we'll have 8k TVs Amazon and Netflix have already announced they'll have 8k services and to do 8k video playback takes about a hundred megabits of throughput which will be less of an issue with the new 5g cellular and some other approaches we'll see it first in in TV this season, we'll see it in computers rolling into next year. So 8K is really beautiful to the eye. And although the subject here isn't very good, when you put an 8K camera with an 8K monitor, it is better than looking in a mirror. And it's, it's hard for me to describe it. It is so fantastic. And so this is all going to unfold around us over the next two to three year period. Further, monitors are going to be kind of uh, attached to each other in a style like this uh, Samsung wall Microsoft uh, surface boards their conference room machines have been released so you can buy them and hook them together in this same style either multiple vertical or multiple horizontal or some other configuration so over time you'll be able to build monitors for conference rooms or displays that are not really limited in size they're just hooked together on edge this particular unit was about 12 foot tall by about 20 foot wide and they had another one that was about 75 foot tall by about 300 foot wide no seams in the middle kind of a big advancement but my favorite new monitor of the year is this one uh the samsung chg90 it's called a gaming monitor it's 49 inches wide and the monitor is the equivalent of two 27 inch monitors side by side uh, recently bought one of these for eight hundred dollars that 14.99 price is the retail but i'd like for you to consider whether a big monitor is better than multiple monitors for you for some of you it might be now we're becoming more mobile and we have a lot of uh, users that you know want to just have a place to land for a little bit either at home or others this particular docking station from Dell the D6000 is the first docking station that I've found that I think is really doing everything I want in the lower right hand picture you can see it hooks up USB-C it also will do regular old USB 2.0 and 3.0 and it will hook up your keyboard your mouse and multiple monitors it runs with all operating systems including iOS and Android the phone operating systems it will do Windows 7 8 and 10 it'll do the Mac OS it'll do uh, Linux and so forth pretty much anything you can throw at it and it's retail is $149 as the year unfolds you'll see other docking stations like this from HP and Lenovo but for the first time we really have a docking station that's pretty inexpensive and does everything we need this is the only Dell docking station we know to work reliably right now too so you want to watch that model pretty carefully now um, USB-C we think is a must-have uh, a lot of these cell phones already have this but we think all computers should be purchased with C in them now there's been debate here about the new iPhones whether they'll eliminate the lightning port and put C ports in and we, we don't know exactly how that's going to come out but the reason we think type C particularly as it goes into the next version 3.2 is important is it's a combination single connector that can do power and or technologies like DisplayPort or Thunderbolt and all of the traditional USBs in a single connection the original C was 10 gig with 3.2 it'll be 20 gig and the standards going to support up to 40 gig of throughput over USB uh, type C so when we start thinking about this in context of phones we want our next phones to have wireless charging and have a resistance to water and dust called IP68. We think OLED screens and 5G are important, but this is a year that you shouldn't be buying a lot of phones if you're in the major markets where 5G is arriving, which includes Dallas and Atlanta and Los Angeles and so forth. Uh, further, you're going to find that it may be cheaper to lease your phone on a month-to-month -month basis rather than buying it outright and putting maintenance on it so be real cautious on phone purchases in the near term uh, you know if we look at the iPhone the current Apple uh, product in this it's only an IP67 phone um, when we look at the Apple watch that supports it is a dominant player right now for uh, wearable watch but vendors tell us that the applications they've been developing here aren't selling all that well people who have their watches tend to love them and there's lots of uh, 
usefulness. And I can tell you that the cellular service without having a cell phone with the AirPods on the Watch 3 seem to be working pretty well at this point. So uh, in the Android world, the Samsung Galaxy S9 has been rated the number one phone above the iPhone 10, and the S10 is due to arrive in roughly the January time frame. So right now I'm thinking I'll go through the iOS 12 update in the fall and then switch over to the S10. Uh, my wife is carrying the Google Pixel 2. And uh, in the last week, we had a little bit extra time together, and I actually played with her updated Google Pixel 2 compared to my iPhone, just kind of feature for feature. And for the things that I used, I realized the Pixel was running faster and was easier to use than my iPhone. And that was like, wow, this that's really... I thought it to be true, and the more I used it, the more I was convinced, yeah, this thing actually works more the way I'm thinking. I'm not anti-iPhone or pro-Google Pixel, but I am pro how do we get the most productivity. The bad news is all these bloody cell phones we're talking about are $1,000. And when I looked at the pricing of all of the other competitors out there, you can't really get in the cell phone market for much less than about $500. So that puts me back in this, maybe we're better off leasing phones and getting the maintenance along the way. So just recognize it's it's really not the best time to be buying cell phones. What it is is kind of what it is. But cameras, by the way, are getting some new capabilities. And I want you to watch uh, cameras like the Startup Lighthouse or Cherry Home. The Cherry Home is pretty interesting in that it, it has enough intelligence it can actually predict heart attack and stroke. And if this continues to work as its pr uh, early versions are working, I'm going to suggest that these might be used more in offices so you can watch team members and actually do some preemptive health uh work with those cameras. Very interesting things. Now, we suggest in both your homes and offices that all of your Internet of Things things, that would be your TVs and your smart speakers and all those devices have a separate subnet. And you can control that at the firewall level in your office and you should do it in your home as well. And, um, you know, reviews in the last 30 days suggest that the Google Home uh, units, the Mini, the Max, and all those are actually the, the most useful of the products right now with Google having the best voice recognition. And to me, that's pretty fascinating because I own, I intentionally buy all these products and try them. Uh, it is clear that the HomePod currently has the best sound. And into the fall, we'll find the new iteration of these HomePods where they can actually put in multiple HomePods in a room and do more surround sound and other advanced features. So if you want the best sound, that's clearly the right uh, product. The base on these things, though, uh, damages fine wood. So you want to put them on a tray or something if you're going to use them. The Cortana Microsoft operating system units like the Harman Kardon. I, again, I've got one of these. The Cortana functionality in the sounds good. It's probably number two in sound quality, but it is clear when I look at the marketplace, the winner here is Amazon with all of their family of Dot and Echo, Echo Plus, Spot, and so forth. And over on the right here, you can see a picture of Brian Tankersley, co-author of these materials and myself, basically using our spots. They are video cameras, and uh, you know there's lots of sophisticated things around this uh, these Echo units. But what I'd like you to understand that both the Google family and the Amazon Echo family are having business applications arrive to make them more useful, where you can actually do inquiries, show me the sales in the last quarter in the eastern region, and it can answer those things, and it can actually work with software to retrieve those answers. Further, some of the translation pieces, either in the, on the earphones themselves or on the, the phones, are getting more sophisticated. For example, the translate features, and we're seeing now capabilities of translating 20, well, high 20s, 28 to 45 different languages. Very nifty stuff. Now, I hope you can hear a bit of that sound coming through, but the main thing I want you to see on this is that the... Um, Basic application here is letting the shopper uh, use the camera in the phone to picture their existing environment and select new equipment to see, or sorry, new furniture to see how it works. And in the process, they can basically pre-visualize how things that they're considering will look in the room itself and then place the order. 
So this is a form of augmented reality and the augmented reality, virtual reality pieces of the technology are moving along pretty well. So that's available today from House, and you'll see other vendors doing this same type of thing. Now, um, another technology that we're excited about, it has arrived almost a full two years earlier than I suggested to you uh, in prior webinars, is 5G. Now, we like 5G for a number of reasons, including its speed and security. The initial deployments are showing 442 meg connection speeds, and it's designed to do up to 20 gig. Now, most of you don't even have 442 meg available to you. You might get a 100 meg or 50 meg service or whatever. We're talking to true 442. And the latency, in other words, the response time is very, very fast. It's designed to run in the one to five second millisecond latency time and you know certain applications CCH pro system tax or access tax specifically requires a minimum of 70 millisecond latencies so if you're running SaaS based cloud pieces this 5g is a game changer the downside though is the antennas have to be relatively close together uh, line of sight distances in the two to three hundred meter range instead of one kilometer for a currently 4g technology. So it's going to take a while for all the towers to get built out and we'll have to use supplemental speeds inside the homes. But this is a big deal because it finally gets us high speed and security for our communications. In the meantime though, we'll deal with a couple other standards. Um, if you have cable as your connection mechanisms, in other words, Cox, Charter, and the like, um, if you've had your service more than about two years, the probability of you getting a Duxus 2 modem is pretty high. And even if your service in theory has been upgraded to you know, 50 over 10 or 100 over 50 or whatever, you're not going to get any faster than 40 over 30, which we've illustrated in the table. So I'm going to suggest that you replace your modem on your cable provider with a Doxis 3.1 or above modem. Uh, it's not a lot of money if you buy it outright, $75 to $125. If you're leasing modems, normally it only has about a three-month payout. So we actually don't recommend that you lease a lot of modems from your cable provider. But this one item might be a bottleneck, particularly if you've had your uh, service for a while. Now, another standard rolling at us over the summer is the Open Connectivity Foundation Spec 1.3, and this consolidates ZigBee and Z-Wave and Bluetooth and a lot of other things into one standard where we can manage the technologies. Now, again, you don't have to know how a lot of those work other than I want you to buy products that are OCF 1.3 compatible when we're dealing with these types of connections. One other uh, announcement actually just occurred yesterday was about the new WPA3 standard and the deployment of 802.11x over mesh networks. So at this point in all of your businesses and homes, we're only recommending mesh networks. We think the most universal ones are the Unify uh, or Amplify products by Ubiquiti. There's three home units I've listed here, the Netgear Orbeez, the Lumas, and the Eros. They're actually not a lot less expensive than the commercial uh, Ubiquiti units. And you can have on the high end the Cisco Meraki's and a few others. There's a lot of players in this area, but here's the key thing. Traditionally, when we put in wireless access points, if we needed more than one in a home or an office, we cut our performance. When you do the mesh networks, you can actually increase your performance by putting in more access points, and they're a little easier to load balance. When we get WPA3 uh, deployed on this, we'll have the appropriate encryption for the first time. I'm going to say it's okay to use public Wi-Fi if it's a WPA3 public Wi-Fi. See, for a security reason, you never, ever want to use Starbucks or, you know, any of those types of places that have public Wi-Fi as hotels because the uh, signal is imminently hackable and the bad actors are getting better at stepping in the middle. And again, mesh networks, 802.11ax plus WPA3, that's a big deal. One other area that's changed in technology that I'm concerned about from a security perspective is Bluetooth. The new Bluetooth 5, which replaced Bluetooth 4 
uh, low energy, uh, has a couple of attributes that are good and a couple that are bad. One is it's got longer range, about 800 feet. In the old days, Bluetooth only went out about 30 feet. And a lot of you use Bluetooth in your home and for headsets and in your cars and places like that. And that's that's actually an okay use of Bluetooth, although, again, it's not super secure. The technology at the low end has a lot more support for devices, and it can run on much lower energy on those type of devices. On the other end, another upside, is the speed's been increased to 2 megabits. So here now we have a mechanism that's fast enough that a lot of data could be transferred on a connection that's not very secure that now runs at greater ranges. So Bluetooth 5, it's got some ups and downs. We're not going to really have a lot of choice. It'll come in most of the products that we have, and we're either going to have to choose to turn it off or not, and we won't be able to secure it very well. So, Div, I think that gets us to the next review question, which is about, uh, you know, 5G. Okay, great. So, I will go ahead and launch the second poll question right now. It should be up in front of folks. Which of the following will be one of the most significant challenges associated with 5G? Uh, and uh, also, Randy, while we're having people come in, a couple of questions that came in. Uh, going back a little bit, AMD or NVIDIA? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, preference on that? Yeah, so it turns out we're kind of talking apples and oranges there. Um, so from a processor chip perspective, we've got Intel and AMD being the two big competitors. AMD's made some really interesting announcements in new generation chips, and for, we put them on the recommended buy list for the first time last year. Uh, so in this case, whether you're buying Intel or AMD, I'm probably a little less fussy on, on either of those two brands. When it comes to NVIDIA, uh, that is one of the dedicated processor type or graphics processor types of units. And it turns out NVIDIA, and I'm normally going to choose, and I'm going to choose NVIDIA over the comparable AMD technology too. So we want you to buy the dedicated processors, and that's one of many players uh, that have those types of mechanisms. Okay, and then uh, another quick one here. Overall, would you say right now Google is better or Amazon as far as a home assistant? Uh, Google or Amazon, you know, in this, in this case, I think what you're really trying to say, is it really Alexa, uh, you know, or is it really Google Home? And by and large, for home, I'm going to suggest Alexa uh, and the Echo units. And the reason for that is the Echo systems, the type of things that are supported, the thermostats, the lights, and so forth, much broader range of options available. Uh, certain functions, the Google unit does better, uh, video casting being an example there. And, um, you know, when you get down to sound quality, I normally hook external speakers to the little dot. So I can actually drive the speaker quality up. But I think you'll have an overall better experience with the Echo units. Okay, sounds great. I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll here in just about five seconds. So if you haven't voted yet, please go ahead and do so. Going once, going twice. All right. Um, so Randy, if you'd like, I'll go ahead and uh, just put the results up here, and then you can go ahead right back to your presentation. All right. Well, I appreciate you doing that. And the key here on that 5G is you got reduced line of sight. You get an increased speed of data connection. Um, and frankly, you won't have to buy as much bandwidth. And frankly, you won't have to throttle down. It's, so 5G is a great big deal in terms of what we see coming there. So um, again, in this next section, I just want to call out a few key things for you to understand. And the main thing here is we've got competitors for our operating systems, whether it's desktop or cloud. You basically have Apple's approaches. You've got the Linux and Amazon approaches and Google and Chrome OS, all the Linux approaches. You have Microsoft's approaches for Azure and desktop. And in the fall, you're going to continue to see upgrades for both Mac OS and for iOS. And uh, the, the changes in there are going to be mainly quality. I, I don't see super big uh, feature changes. I read about a dozen on the iOS this morning, for example, again. But it may be for some of you, particularly if you're running cloud-based, that Linux is back. And we're going to suggest that you may want to run 
some version of Linux or Google Android or Chrome and use some sort of a, a, a Unix or Linux based suite, G Suite or you know, one of those types of products and use the rest of your accounting applications in browser. And that'll do perfectly well for a lot of small businesses. Um, hosting of phone systems has come around too. And frankly, a lot of vendors are doing hosted voice of Vantage being a good example of this, but they're almost all universally using Linux for its reliability. So on the big cloud hosting vendors, you've got Amazon doing a lot of the back end uh, services, a lot of products that are in the marketplace run on Amazon for their back end, and they control this uh, place where data has to live. Amazon has the most flexibility with 52 availability zone in 18 geographic regions, and you'll see that makes them way bigger than their competitors like Google, who only currently has 13 regions, growing five more this year. And Google's done some wonderful things with their investments in the infrastructure, but uh, clearly, Amazon's the leader in here, yet Google and Azure both have this high-speed machine learning investments that they've been doing. So in Google's case, for example, they have the Tensor Processing Unit, which in May got its third generation upgrade, and that's a big deal to process certain types of artificial intelligence and machine mm -hmm. learning. Microsoft, of course, has been growing out their cloud, and they're putting the Office 365 and other hosting services over in there. But their infrastructure is very, very light. And so when I'm thinking about Microsoft here with you, what I recognize is that most of us who are in public practice don't really have a lot of choice but to use this because of the publishers of our tax products and some other services. And the main thing I'd like you to know here is that Microsoft is pushing out updates. They call that call them semi-annual channels now, and they have three different types. They basically have the monthly mode, they have a pilot mode, and they have a broad channel, those three. And our general guidance is you should always choose broad channel, but Microsoft is now forcing updates even when you don't want them. In the April release of their product, they switched to 18 month support windows too. So I've illustrated this with a few tables, and you can see here that the servicing extension for Windows 10 basically now shows these 18 month windows. If you look at the versions here, notice you can see the year it was released, last one's 18, and the month that was released, March. So the actual release to market was April 30th, as it turns out, but that's when the code was done, was March. And so you're going to have these continuous updates happening every six months or so in Windows and in Office. And for quite some time, I'd been suggesting that you could stay on Windows 7 or 8, but unfortunately, with Office 365 and Office 2019, that product will only run on Windows 10. And you heard earlier, with the hardware chips, they're only supporting Windows 10. So in effect, a whole bunch of you have to think about when you make your conversion, and January of 2020 has been kind of the magic date to eliminate Windows 7 because of its end-of-life support. But if you're on Office 365, you can't run Microsoft Office as it releases in the fall. And so I've really concluded at this point, we have no option to run Windows 7 or 8 if you're running Microsoft Office 365 at this point. And frankly, within the next short while, we're going to be forced over into Windows 10, or maybe they'll just call it Windows as things go on. We also see some convergence around certain dates. And you might recognize this stock term of triple witching event. We're noticing that in October of 2025, there must be some stock options expiring inside Microsoft because they've forced a bunch of product expirations into that window. Well, how about Office? Because if you look at the Office uh, dates now for just a minute, you'll notice that Office 2016 ends that same October 14th, 2025 date, and the new Office 2019 that ships in the fall also expires October of 2025. And for those of you who are on Office 2010, Notice that it's gone in October 13th of 2020. So October of 2020 and October of 2025 are pretty big 
dates and a lot of convergence going on around those dates. Now, again, if we think about when you have to update, we believe that broad semi-annual channel is when most of you, sh or it's what most of you should be on because this rolls out the Microsoft changes in January and July. And if you're in public practice, those are clearly better times than the second week of March and the second week of September. We don't like home grade hardware and we don't like home grade Microsoft stuff. And the reason we don't like home grade Microsoft stuff is you can only be on the monthly channel and that means you get monthly updates. Microsoft's releasing code that does not work very well. And if you take a monthly upgrade, I can guarantee you're going to have things break on you on a regular basis at this point. So when I start looking at all this stuff coming together, and the new Office 2019 that arrives here in the second half, we're thinking it's going to be October. Many of you will be forced over into Windows 10 and the new Office 2019. But 2019 also has some problems because you cannot do standard deployments because Microsoft won't have the standard MSI deployment. And instead of having a 10-year life cycle, they did a seven year to get to this same October 2025 timing. So if you're a history buff, you recognize this next phrase because October 2020 has a couple of three things going on that give me concern. First, whether you're Office 365 or your premise-based Office deployed, you have to hook into Microsoft's Active Directory. And what Microsoft's trying to do here is get control of securities and licensing. Number two, there's a hardware change called UFI. UFI stands for User Extensible Firmware Interface. It's the replacement for BIOS. Pretty much all computers since about 2010 are UFI, although there's a few that are still firmware. But Microsoft, Intel, Dell, HP, Apple, Lenovo have all agreed that they're going to deploy computers that lock the operating systems in so they can't be changed. And so if you buy a new machine and it was configured for Windows 10, you can't choose to put Linux on it as an example. So this lock-in is actually good in some ways from a security perspective and bad in some ways because you can't change your own hardware. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But uh, this date of October 2020 basically puts us in the lock-in mode. Now, on the low end, Microsoft will support uh, lower powered chips. And so the earlier question from Patty about, you know, do we use a different grade computer? Some of these are not slower. And when you run in Windows 10 S mode, that's the home grade, notice I don't want the monthly upgrades, but you can buy computers that come with S mode and upgrade them to 10 Pro along the way. And you get a lot of benefits by doing that, including support for the lower end hard ARM hardware, but also some of the other uh, integration points. So what we think is going to happen to us here is we'll wind up with this whole Windows environment. I'm really thinking I'm going to stop calling it Windows 10, but we have to wait for Microsoft to say that's how it's going to work. And we're going to get continuous upgrades on Windows. The features that arrived in Windows in April, frankly, were not significant enough from a business perspective. It hardly merits discussion. And I think a lot of the changes that are happening in Windows frankly don't affect our day-to-day -day operations other than we're getting updated on a regular basis. So Div, I think that gets us to the next review question. All right, sounds great. So let me go ahead and pull the next one up. And so attendees, you should be seeing the next question open in front of you. Which of the following best describes Windows 10 S mode? Um, and uh, Randy, one other question that came in while people are answering that poll question was, um, can you clarify when Office 365 users will be required to abandon Windows 7? Uh, if I had to give a specific date, it'll, do, it'll depend, Div, on when it's actually officially released. And I'm going to suggest to you it's probably going to be released around October 1, and therefore you'll have to upgrade by roughly December 1. Because the current license agreement says 60 or 90 days, and we think it's going to be shortened to 60. So you'd have to do it before the end of the year. They might leave 90 in place to kind of let people get out to January. And I'm going to give you a way to work your way around that here in just a moment. 
Okay, sounds great. Um, so we've got about 85% of people have voted at this point. So folks, please go ahead and get in your votes here in the last 10 seconds or so. Reminder, this is poll question number three out of four. We'll have one more poll question coming up shortly here in the in the minutes that we've got left here. Um, so let's go ahead and close it out in five seconds here. Going once, going twice, and we're going to close it out. Yeah. So, you know, notice in this one, uh, Windows 10, it, it can be upgraded so it's not the third answer. And basically, it's designed to run 32-bit applications and mainly be connected to the Internet. So it's kind of like a Chromebook is the best way to think about it. All right. Now, we only have about five minutes left, friends. And uh, there's some other things that I want to drive home here. So for many of you who run Windows 7 today, and you are faced with an Office upgrade, Microsoft wants you to buy Microsoft 365. That includes Windows plus mobile device management and Office 365. For most of you, 300 users or less, you can get the business piece at about $20 a month. If you're bigger or you need more sophisticated Office features, it's gonna cost you $50 a user a month. Those are pretty big ticket items, but it's the only way we know to really solve this. Now, Microsoft last September came out with a new Office 365, Microsoft 365 plan, which is only $4 a month. It's really quite a value for you know, factory floors and restaurant workers and so forth. And for some of you, this actually is enough office to get the job done. Uh, Microsoft's also going to be changing their server uh, infrastructure. And if you have a budget where you're actually spending money on Windows Server SQL Exchange, you need to increase by four to six fold. Yeah, four times, six times what you did in your last renewal because of the way Microsoft is changing their, their pricing. All right. Now, um, a few other things I just want to call out in these last few minutes together. Progressive Web Apps, some accounting software, and CPA firm software. We believe that all of you should be watching for and looking for Progressive Web Apps. These apps can work offline. They work in a browser. It's a single code base. You can run it on a phone, a tablet, on a computer, or on a website all the same way. And it's a pretty big deal because Microsoft, uh, Google, and others have all agreed on this. We thought Apple would agree with their releases here at the developers conference in early June. They didn't do it, but they made some motions around it. So we think this is a big deal for the long term. Number two, uh, you know, again, when you look at the small business accounting, your main competitors are Zoho, the Powercast folks who are sponsoring today's webinar, the QuickBooks Online and Zero folks, and then you got Applos and Accounting Suite. Those are kind of the big players out of the 300 or so accounting products that are out there. That's kind of what we see. And I normally mention Zoho because if you want to build an app, you can build an app inside this particular product. In the mid-market, you've got the Acumaticas and the Sage Intex and the NetSuites as well as some of the traditional players. But you're notice, going to notice here I have a lot fewer recommendations for accounting software than I typically would, Acumatica being of interest here because of its non-per-user pricing, one of the few vendors that don't do that. If you're in the CPA firm world, it is a wild change period. All new audit tools, new tax tools, new practice management, new document management. Things are going upside down in all sorts of places. So the most interesting develops I've listed for you here on the left with teammate analytics and the docket 4.6 and receipt banks one tap and canopy and powercast. And there's some other things that are going on with the audit accelerator and Podio and Thompson's on dots and XCM workflow. So don't ignore those. Again, there's other series presentations that'll talk more about those. From a security perspective, I'll just mention this is Steen Avranchard who invented the YubiKey, but we've seen pretty significant changes in security issues this year. Remember that all of you need to be in a position to do breach reporting within 72 hours because of the changes of the New York law and other states like Colorado and so forth that have done similar types of things. Further, as GDPR continues to unfold, you're going to have to be able to accommodate that as well. So when I start looking at the changes from a security perspective, NIST changed the password uh, standards requiring a simpler password rather than a more complex password. But the bottom line for most of this is multi-factor authentication is really needed if you're going to work remotely. 
Uh, I don't trust a lot of the Google and Office 365 text authentications. I don't think they're as accurate as some of the other methodologies that are out there, but if you're working remotely, consider multi-factor. Now, lots of people will talk to you about emerging technologies. I've just included a simple list here, and you need to kind of uh, make sure that you schedule time to learn about these different emerging technologies. Again, Div, at some future time, we might just run a whole webinar on emerging alone, and um, you'll be appalled at how all this fits together. But at this point, these are all of the big things. Just remember, vendors are selling a lot of what I'd call fake artificial intelligence or artificial artificial intelligence, and they're promoting FOMO, fear of missing out, on things like blockchain and machine learning and AI. Don't be pulled into that too soon because most of the products are not really ready for prime time, but there's a lot of super exciting stuff happening in emerging technology. And you know that really drives us into cryptocurrencies and all sorts of other things, but the most interesting simple tool for most vendors is cognitive services where voice recognition and face recognition can be added to applications with some very, very simple code changes. So all industries are going to be affected, including the ability for uh, construction to work. So I just came from Chicago this past weekend and read about a housing development where the automated bricklayer was doing the work. And that machine was renting for $3,000 a week, but could lay 4,000 bricks a day. So these types of robots are going to be pretty much everywhere as we see it. Uh, we're seeing beautiful developments in medical technologies and, you know, many things that can help us just day to day, like the smart medicine cap to remind us to take pills or something simple like the Ember mug to keep our tea or coffee warm, some really beautiful stuff. And 3D printed tires are another great example of something that's you know, not right around the corner, but we find almost no industry or any profession that's not touched by this new technology. So my favorite find of this past year was the new glasses that give sight to uh, largely legally blind people. They're only about $10,000. They seem to be, you know, quite beautiful. So many things on technology can be used for good or bad. And what we'd like you to do is use these technologies to your benefit. Um, and we also see, you know, little devices like these uh, BIMPOs that basically allow, uh, you know, baby monitoring with a wristband, cheap, $28, really nifty, nifty stuff on all fronts. So what I'd like to do is just maybe uh, give you an opportunity to ask, ask that last question, Div, and I'll clean up any other questions that are out there. Okay, sounds great. So let me go ahead and launch poll question number four. Um, so the question is, which is, what's the most interesting technology development for you? Quantum computing, 5G, software as a service, or Microsoft Office 365? So please go ahead and select one of those and click submit. This is the fourth of our poll questions. Also, Randy, somebody had uh, written in earlier and asked, for somebody who's not a, not a techie but is interested in learning more about computing technologies, is there a good book that you'd recommend? A fair question but I don't think there's actually a book because the technology is moving, frankly, a little too fast. I think you're better off picking a few relatively thoughtful publishers. Uh, Paul Throw might be a good example, uh, but uh, you know, I think you're better off with two or three blog sources to do this, and that way you'll get nice summaries if uh, uh, that would be my approach, frankly. So I appreciate the book question, but moving too bloody fast for that. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I said. Right. And by the and, way, I love I loved Michael's question. Is 5G going to increase cancer? Uh, I actually think it may not because it's operating a different frequency. So I've read the research on that and don't think it's as bad as 4G. By the way, we've had a couple of people comment in and say that they would love to hear an emerging technologies uh, webinar from you. So, so we'll, you and I will both make a note of that, Randy, that uh, there's definitely interest in that. Yeah, you know, Dev, when we were talking about it for this year's uh, uh, webinar, I actually debated about doing that, but I know you have a lot of uh, faithful attendees who kind of look for this cut. And Tech Update, I think, is just as important as it's always been. Uh, but I got to tell you, the emerging technologies, uh, it's really complex, and I'm seeing a whole lot of people who would like to believe, have you believed that they're experts, and the information they're 
uh, pr pronouncing the information they're giving, frankly, isn't very accurate. So you need to proceed with a bit of caution there because I, I'm not sure I've got it all right, but I got a pretty good idea where I think it's going and I want you to be safe because there's a lot of snake oil sales going on right now. Indeed. Um, so, Randy, I want to thank you again for your time today. Uh, obviously, by all the questions that have come in and 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 people writing in, thank you. Uh, obviously, they appreciated it as much as I did as well. Um, so, I'm going to just go ahead and take back control here for just one second to uh, close this out. And uh, so, again, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today as well. Um, our next expert webinar is two weeks from today, not next week. Next week is the 4th of July, so you've got better things to do than come and attend my webinar. Um, so two weeks from today, Gary Boomer will be talking about blockchain, what accountants need to know. Uh, Gary Boomer, the head of Boomer Consulting. Um, so don't miss that. If you haven't registered for all of the webinars yet, just go to 2018webinars.com, 2018webinars.com. You can sign up for all the remaining webinars at once, and we've got an amazing list of speakers coming up just as we've had amazing speakers so far and once again if you'd like a personalized demo of accountants world solutions you can go to accountantsworld.com you can go to accountingpower.com if you want to learn specifically about our accounting solution uh, or just go to accountantsworld.com to learn about all of our solutions or give us a call at that phone number that you see up there so once again thank you randy for your time today and thanks to all the attendees who joined us as well i so much appreciate everybody's time we'll hope to see you around the country soon Great, thanks.